Good evening. If you can please take a seat, appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Gadi Levy, and as of yesterday, I am the executive director of the Temple Emanuel uh, Skerbel Center for Jewish Life and Learning. It is a true pleasure for me to be here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, and joining us. I am very excited about this event tonight, and not only because it is my first event at the Skerbo Center, but because it is rooted in our key mission of bringing people together for education and learning. All of us at the Skerbo Center share a personal passion for learning. Events like this remind us to think critically, to open our minds, and to consider other perspectives, to listen to help lead us to empathy, understanding, compassion, and common grounds. When you walked in today, you should have gotten an index card. If you have a question for the panelists, please fill it out. We will collect it and present it to our moderator. I would also like to mention that at the conclusion of the evening, uh, we will be selling the book, Sons of Abraham, which will all be also be signed if you are interested. Uh, also, I will not do my job if I do not encourage you to add your name to our mailing list. Uh, and to collect on your way out at the brochure for the summer programs. Um, we are planning a lot of new programs for the Skerbo Center for the fall, including classes, seminars, cultural programs that will tap into your educational drive and expand your view of the world. I hope you will join us. Thank you for coming tonight. And to introduce our speakers, please welcome our moderators for tonight's discussion, our senior rabbi, Rabbi Josh Davidson. Thank you. Let me add my welcome to all of you and thank our terrific Emanuel Skirball Center staff and take the opportunity to welcome the new executive director of the Skirball Center, Dr. Gadi Levy, who comes to us from the American Jewish University in Los Angeles, where he served as vice president and as the dean of its renowned Center for Continuing Education. Dr. Levy is going to take our program to new and exciting heights in the months and years to come. Welcome, Gadi. Of course, I very much want to thank as well the staff of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding for their partnership in tonight's important event. No cause is closer to my heart than building bridges between faith communities. It's an area in which I've been engaged professionally for about 15 years, both with the African American Christian and Middle Eastern Muslim communities here in the city and in my previous pulpit in northern Westchester. So to have Rabbi Mark Schneier and Imam Shamsi Ali, two of the greatest bridge builders we have with us tonight, is a tremendous honor. Imam Shamsi Ali is a renowned Muslim scholar and communal leader. He was Imam of the city's largest mosque, the Islamic Cultural Center on 96th Street. Now he's chairman of the Al Hikmah Mosque in Astoria and the director of the Jamaica Muslim Center in Queens. Imam Ali serves as an advisory board member to numerous interfaith organizations, including the Tannenbaum Center and the Federation for Middle East Peace. He is the chairman of the board of the ASEAN Muslim Federation of North America, a board member of the Partnership of Faith in New York, that's where I met him for the first time, and co-founder of the Universal Clergy Coalition International. He's also assistant director and board member of the Muslim Foundation of America and chairman of New York's annual Muslim Day Parade. He's also the vice president of the Asian American Coalition USA and its UN representative. A native Indonesian, he's certainly well known within that community, but his reach and influence extend well beyond it. He has become one of the most visible faces of Islam in America and around the world. He's lectured in churches, synagogues, and other institutions, both nationally and worldwide. He was among the few religious leaders invited to accompany President George W. Bush to visit Ground Zero just days after 9-11. He was in appointed ambassador for peace by the International Religious Federation in 2002, and in 2006, New York Magazine named him one of the seven most influential religious leaders in New York City. He has been featured at interfaith conferences around the world, 
in 2009 for his dedication to building bridges between religious communities. He was one of 100 recipients of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, the highest recognition given to immigrants for their contributions to America and the world. And every year since, he has been chosen as one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by the Royal Islamic Strategic Study Center in Jordan and Georgetown University. He's a frequent speaker at United Nations forums and a guest contributor for numerous television networks. Since 1990, Rabbi Mark Schneier has served as the founding rabbi of one of the most dynamic synagogues in the world, the Hampton Synagogue. He also serves as guest rabbi of the new synagogue of Palm Beach. The 18th generation of a distinguished rabbinic family He's led both the World Jewish Congress and the New York Board of Rabbis. Honored by the United States Congress and the State of Israel as an advocate for human and civil rights and religious and ethnic tolerance, he is the founder and president of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding. His work in the field of intergroup and interfaith relations has engaged multiple communities, but certainly a great focus of his work has been with the Muslim community. Rabbi Schneier spearheaded the International Weekend of Twinnings of Mosques and Synagogues and numerous national and international gatherings of Muslims and Jews. From 2008 to 2012, he served on the steering committee of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's World Conference on Dialogue. In 2010, he served as the keynote speaker at the Doha Conference for Interfaith Dialogue, and the next year, he was the first rabbi to be received by the king of Bahrain. Rabbi Schneier has represented the Jewish community at many other historic events, such as the inaugural interfaith gathering at the Democratic National Convention, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's 50th annual convention, the European Parliament's Kristallnacht 70th anniversary commemoration, and the NAACP's Centennial Convention. Named one of the 50 most prominent Jews in the United States by The Forward and one of America's top 50 rabbis by Newsweek, Rabbi Schneier is the recipient of myriad awards, including the Interfaith Award from the Islamic Center of Long Island, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, and numerous civil rights honors from such organizations as the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the NAACP. In 2009, Rabbi Schneier was inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers at Morehouse College in Atlanta. His book, Shared Dreams, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Jewish Community, was published in 2000. And now together, Rabbi Schneier and Imam Ali have co-authored Sons of Abraham, a candid conversation about the issues that divide and unite Jews and Muslims. The book is truly wonderful narrating Marx and Chomsky's individual and shared journeys toward a pluralistic vision of faith and their mutual commitment to build a global movement of Muslims and Jews committed to communication, reconciliation, and cooperation. For Jews and Muslims looking to learn more about their own faiths, too, it is a highly educational volume. And while the questions I'll pose tonight, developed by the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding and the Skirball Center, are intended to lift up the lessons of the book, please buy it. It is a very important contribution to our community. In fact, if you want a copy, and we have some left, and it's more than you are able to manage, find me. I want this book sold out by the time the night is done. It is that important. Imam Ali and Rabbi Schneier, in the opening chapters of the book, you each narrate your respective journeys up to the point of your first meeting. We'll come to that meeting in a bit. But first, I'd like to ask you to reflect on the paths you traveled early on as students and as leaders within the Jewish and Muslim communities, particularly with regard to the prejudices and stereotypes that might have colored your view of the other. Imam Ali, why don't you begin, and then Rabbi Schneier. Good evening, and Rabbi, thank you very much for such a gracious introduction. You're um, welcome. I was kind of worried that uh, the introduction is longer than the speech itself. <laughs> it's not my fault that you've done so many wonderful things. Thank you very much. 
Um, uh, I would like to thank you uh, really uh, for hosting us tonight. It is uh, a great honor for me. Uh, I have met you. I have uh, met uh, your predecessor also. Uh, but this is my first time uh, entering into this great, great house of Lord. Uh, and I'm very blessed to be here tonight. Um, reflecting back uh, into uh, my own personal journey, and I call, I call this personal transformation. Uh, I was born in a very uh, remote area in Indonesia. Um, uh, my father was a, a very humble farmer, uh, but for whatever the reason that I was a kind of rebellious kid, so I used to fight a lot. So my father sent me to a school called Pesantren in Indonesia, and it means madrasa. Probably have heard the word madrasa. It's like midrash, where you study religious, pure religious uh, studies. Um, and then when I finished it, I was um, sent uh, abroad to further my studies, and fortunately or unfortunately sent to Pakistan uh, to International Islamic University during the invasion of Soviet Union to Afghanistan. So you can imagine the heat of uh, the environment that we had at the time, being as a young guy, a young Muslim, young students, uh, neighboring to Afghanistan, uh, watching the war every day. Um, I, stayed in, I studied in Pakistan for seven years. Uh, I finished my bachelor and master degree. Then I went to Saudi Arabia. I, I got an opportunity to be a teacher in Jeddah Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So from Indonesia to Pakistan to Saudi Arabia, I studied the Holy Quran, and I read the Holy Quran as usually. We understood it as many Muslims understood it. Um, in 2000, uh, 1996, I met the Indonesian ambassador to the United Nations in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia. So I was assigned basically to deliver a speech about Hajj to the group of ambassadors of Indonesia uh, from around the world that are performing Hajj this year. And after the speech, he came to me. He said to me, um, are you interested if I, I, I invite you to New York? And I didn't have anything in mind. For what? So I asked him, what do you want? And he said, we have a small community in Astoria, Queens, that happened to be an Indonesian mosque, and we need a leader because we don't have anybody to lead us. So I said, okay, I'm coming. So I came, uh, and since then, I arrived here in this country. I never thought, first of all, that America basically is the America that I know today. I was imagining that America is a European country, it's all white people. And the first person that I met in, in the airport was a Pakistani taxi driver <laughs> who didn't even speak English to me, but he spoke Urdu to me. Because we spoke, that I, I told him that I studied in Pakistan, and, he said, and, he, and, and then he turned into Urdu language. He spoke. So since then, I said, you know, is this really America? And then I rented a house in Astoria, uh, you know, close to, uh, it's a neighboring to basically uh, senior citizens, a very wonderful family. To be honest with you, this Irish Catholic was the first one who opened my eyes. I read the Holy Quran. I read the hadith of the prophet. I encountered many verses that talk about others, about the importance of diversity in our community. But I never, you know, I never came to a conclusion that the Holy Quran basically appreciate, not only appreciate, but embrace diversity. So this guy and his wife, every morning he came out from his house, cleaned his driveway, and hours. So in the beginning, I was kind of suspicious. Was he, what he wanted to show me. Probably he wanted to show me his religion, you know, because we have that kind of deep suspicion when we come to the others. Then after months, after months, there is nothing. He never talked about the religion. September 11 happened. And I, for whatever the reason, I was invited by the city hall, not the city hall, but the, the, the mayor, to represent the Muslim to the first ever uh, press conference called religious leaders' response. And there I met the first time the rabbi. I met Rabbi Joe Batasnik, in fact. He was in the press conference. I didn't even shake hand with him. Because what we have studied about Jewish people is different. So we have that something in the back of our head. You know, we understood the Holy Quran literally. And of course, this is what I'm going to mention, that when we understand our holy books literal, in a literal fashion, that understanding may hijack us. So I have a lot of things in the back of my head about the Jewish people, so I didn't even shake hands. Some days later, 
there is an event at the Yankee Stadium. I was invited to represent the Muslim community. I was the one who chanted the Holy Quran. So in fact, I met the, the senior Shunayar, his father, and he came to me directly. He said, are you from Indonesia? I said, yes, I'm an Indonesian. He said, I love Indonesia. I said, why? He said, I have a great friend in Indonesia. His name is Gus Dur. And Gus Dur is, if you may remember, we have a former president, a blinded president, a blind president. This is a friend of your, your father, basically. And he invited me to his synagogue, and I've been to that since till day, today. But 2005, this would happen. Pope John died. And basically, I don't want to mention this one because we are going to discuss it later on. But I just wanted to say this. You know, m my own journey is really um, challenging, but it has been a transformative for myself. I have come to an ignorance, to a misconception uh, about the Jewish people because of the lot of theories in the Muslim world today about the Jewish people. Every day that we read the news that Jewish people are this and that, and unfortunately we never encounter. And into, even today, it is still a challenge. When you go to the Muslim and talk that we are friends now with the rabbi, we can author a book, they say, really? How come you do that? This is what the Quran says. And the Holy Quran says, you know, they will never be pleased with you until you follow the religion, for example. Or the Holy Quran says, do not be friends with Jews and Christians. And the word friends, unfortunately, have been mis- understood from a word called wilaya, al-wilaya, al-awliya in the Holy Quran. So in a nutshell, I just wanted to say that this journey has really changed me personally, and I hope I can also change others. First, I want to thank all of you for joining here this evening. I want to wish your new director, Gadi, uh, great success on this new challenge. And I feel very much at home here at Temple Emmanuel. I still remember as a very, very young child, I would walk down Fifth Avenue with my father. We'd go for a stroll on Saturday afternoons and Somehow we'd always bump into Rabbi Perlman. And then uh, Rabbi Sobel was like, uh, I wouldn't say a surrogate father, maybe an older brother to me. Uh, David Posner is one of my closest and uh, most intimate friends. And now we have the leadership of a rabbi who is seen by his colleagues as truly one of the most extraordinary, stellar rabbinic figures in the United States today. So uh, I know you just began your tenure here at Emmanuel, and we extend our good wishes and blessings for your continued success. Thank you. In your stewardship of this uh, great and venerated congregation. Thank you. So, as you heard from Rabbi Davidson, I'm the 18th generation rabbis in my family. And uh, my mother would always tell the story how at the age of two, I would stand on the dining room table and pretend that I was preaching. You know, I had that rabbinic drug, probably the way you had growing up in, uh, in your distinguished home. And uh, had a somewhat conventional Orthodox upbringing in terms of my education. I went to Yeshiva University. I spent uh, 12 years at Yeshiva from high school through my ordination by Rabbi Soloveitch. And when it came to issues of Muslims or Arabs, for me it was very clear. They're the enemy. They are to be demonized. Uh, Muslims cannot be trusted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So my venture into really intergroup relations began in 1989, when, with the late 
Joseph Papp. How many of you remember Joseph Papp, the great Broadway impresario? So Joe and I established the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding. So you might ask, what does Joseph Papp have to do with ethnic understanding? Yes, we remember him as the producer of A Chorus Line or Pirates of Penzance and other legendary Broadway shows. But Joe Papp was also the pioneer of colorblind casting. Today, if you speak with a Morgan Freeman, if you speak with a Raul, uh, the late Raul Julio, uh, a James Earl Jones, they would tell you, had not been for Joseph Papp, they would never have had the opportunity to play Shakespearean roles that had been exclusively the reserve of the white Caucasian population. It was Joe who broke that color barrier, uh, particularly for African Americans and for Latinos. So we established the Foundation for uh, Ethnic Understanding in 1989 for the first 17 years. We're now in our 25th year. All we did was focus exclusively on rebuilding the historic black Jewish alliance in this country. When you think back to the civil rights struggles, 1950s and 1960s, in fact, you should know that on June 21st, just in 11 days, we will mark the 50th anniversary of the tragic killings of Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney in the swamps of Mississippi during the 1964 Summer of Freedom Rides. There was no segment of American society that provided as much and as consistent support to Dr. King and to African Americans as did the Jewish community. But Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. understood that a people who fight for their own rights are only as honorable as when they fight for the rights of all people. And in my first book, Share Dreams, which documents Dr. King's relationship with the Jewish people, his advocacy for the state of Israel, his total disdain for <coughs> anti-Semitism, his involvement in the plight of Soviet Jewry, we see that the civil rights partnership was more one of mutual respect and mutual of concern, not only what Jews did for African Americans, but also what the most prominent leader of the civil rights struggle, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., how he championed the issues and the concerns of the Jewish community as well. And I believe that the foundation, and many of you know my celebrated partner and chairman of the foundation is Russell Simmons. Uh, Russell, who is the uh, creator of hip hop, you know, they always joke about the rabbi and the rapper, or the rabbi and the uh, rap mogul, you know, and we always have our issues, you know, I'm trying to teach him, or at least educate him about cantorial music, he's trying to uh, enlighten my knowledge of hip hop music. I remember two years ago before we were heading for Israel, so over the course of the conversation, Russell says, Mark, you know, what's so, um, I, I, I heard this term ludicrous in the middle of the conversation, I said, What's so ludicrous about going to Israel? I said, you, mean, you never heard of the rapper Ludicrous. So I've had a whole education. Uh, that's for the younger element in the uh, audience this evening. Um, and I think we are greatly responsible where today the state of black Jewish relations in this country is one of cooperation and not one of conflict. We find that African Americans and Jews nationwide have engaged in programs to explore and to rediscover shared values. Seven years ago, it was Russell Simmons who challenged me. He said, look, black Jewish relations, really mission accomplished. Either we need to move on and to make a decisive difference, or it's time to close up shop. And Russell Simmons, of all people, says, Rabbi, I believe the greatest challenge now facing the interreligious world is to find the path to narrow the divide, the chasm between Muslims and Jews. Math is very simple, my friends. 
14 million Jews, and 1.4 billion Muslims. And particularly for our co-religionists, I mean the Jewish communities in Europe, in Latin American today, but particularly in Europe, this has become an existentialist issue. How do we find that path to narrow this gap? And how do we find ways for Muslims and Jews to cooperate and to work together? So, as my friend Chomsky pointed out, this has also been a transformative uh, experience for me. Um, I have been so blessed not only to have co-authored this book, and as you know, President Bill Clinton actually wrote the foreword to our book, which has been published by Random House. But I'm so blessed to have this friendship with the Imam. And I must tell you, when typically when we speak, either before a Jewish audience or in a Jewish congregation, or at a Jewish community center, I always get you know, the comment, Rabbi, we love what you do. Right? We're all for it, but come on. He's not, he's not a real Muslim. Why, why is he not a real Muslim? Because he's not Arab. right? He's from Southeast Asia. But how many people acknowledge or appreciate the fact that only 16% of the world's Muslim population is Arab. Only 16%. The largest Muslim population happens to hail from Southeast Asia. And you should know that you heard all the accolades that Rabbi Davidson showered upon um, Imam Ali, but when you speak with the governments of Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, they have anointed Imam Shamsi Ali. He really has become their international spiritual leader and spokesperson. So you are in the presence of a very, very prominent and distinguished leader. So just to conclude what I should have concluded about three minutes ago, but you know, I, I often I see some of my congregants here. They know that when it comes to my sermons, Josh, I am very, very succinct. You know, I, I often uh, have shared with students that for a sermon to be memorable, it need not be eternal. <laughs> All right. So Saturday mornings. You, you know, can, I have congregants here too, and you may be giving them ideas that isn't that won't be helpful to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I have the twelve-minute drill every Shabbat. But to conclude that. You know, the, the Imam referred to our journey. I will not sit here and represent to you that uh, we have uh, reached the promised land of Muslim-Jewish reconciliation. We have a very, very long way to go. But what has been remarkable have been the uh, tremendous strides that we have made over these past seven years. We are now operating this global movement, <clears throat> excuse me, in 35 countries on five continents. And our work is not about dialogue, transcends dialogue. It's about fighting for the other. You want to be part of our, net, of our network, you must be a Jew who is ready to speak out against Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry. And you must be a Muslim who is prepared to speak out against anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. And uh, remember, the Israelites took them 40 years to get to the Promised Land. So we hope you'll join us as we continue on this journey. We have a long way to go, but I will leave you with one very optimistic and hopeful note, and that is our journey has begun. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I know that um, after 9-11, many of us in the Jewish community, perhaps especially those of us already engaged in interfaith dialogue with the Christian and African American communities, understood that the American Muslim community now <coughs> required our presence by their side. 
For each of you, I know that 9-11 played an important role in shaping your own sense of mission and purpose. How did your work to begin to change at that point? Rabbi Schneier, maybe you would begin and then, and then Imam Ali. I think you're being very gracious and benevolent in your question in terms of describing the Jewish community back in 2011. Um, I find that very few, not only Jews, but particularly Jewish leaders, had that sensitivity to reach out to the American Muslim community. And if they did, they were clueless as to how to begin. Yeah. That's one of the great challenges I still find to this very day. Uh, many of my colleagues, I should say many of our colleagues, who are so involved in uh, Christian Jewish understanding, who are involved in um, relations with the Vatican, when it comes to reaching out to the uh, Muslim population, they are literally clueless. Uh, they just don't know how to begin, what to do, or they're just ambivalent and indifferent. You know, when there's such a focus on dialogue with the church, the Catholic church, we have no issues <laughs> today with the Catholic church. You know, the Pope's greatest challenge in Rome is uh, when he meets a, uh, and, and he probably greets more Jewish delegations than any other a faith community is which kosher restaurant should he order from, you know, from the ghetto in Rome. You know, that's his greatest challenge today. We, we have no issues. And here you have this glaring, <coughs> glaring uh, conflict. And as I repeated, you look at the Jewish communities in France, look at what just happened in Brussels, uh, look at the UK, Germany, throughout Europe. It's, this is an as existentialist challenge that's now facing the Jewish people. And you would think that, that Jewish leaders would be giving out their time, their energy, and resources. So I think that you know, the two of us have set this example. I'm thrilled that more and more, um, particularly in the leadership of the Jewish community, are looking to us in terms of ways to begin this process, either for their organizations or for themselves. Um, but as I pointed out before, you know, we're at the very beginning of this journey. And I would hope that those of you who are joining us here this evening, that you'll walk away with just a greater sensitivity as to why this has become such a critical issue, particularly particularly to the Jewish people worldwide. You know, it, it is true that after 9-11, um, there were a lot of us within the Jewish community, clearly not as many as one would hope. Um, you know, you, I think you're, you're right. Um, but those of us who were interested in trying to reach out to the American Muslim community, um, many of us didn't know where to go at the outset. And I, I was at Central Synagogue at the time, and I remember being told that next to a Middle Eastern restaurant on 55th Street, there was a, a mosque that was, I think, led by an Egyptian imam at the time. So I walked over there, and I introduced myself. Um, the, the community reached out to you because the community knew that they needed to, to, to be present for um, the American Muslim community. You didn't necessarily need to reach back, but you clearly did. 9-11 played an important role in shaping your sense of mission and purpose. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, let me begin by acknowledging that I think the most challenging part of this journey is fighting against our own pre-existing misperception about the other. Uh, you know, as I said that before I came to this country, or let me say, when I came to this country, I, I found a, a very big dilemma among the Muslim community that we are coming to our houses of worship while neighbors don't know what we are doing because there is no outreach program. We never go, go out and knock the door introducing ourselves. So what I did when I led the small community in Astoria was um, knocking the door of a church nearby. Uh, but I have to be honest that uh, when it comes to the Muslim-Jewish 
relations, the mistrust that, we ha that these two communities have is so deep. Uh, and uh, for whatever the reason. Um, and I think uh, mostly because of media, mostly because of politics, uh, but also the, the, um, the literal fashion of understanding of the, uh, of the religious text that we have. So it's really difficult to fight against that misconception about the Jewish community. When I met uh, Ruben Stein in 2003, for example, we have a three-faith three, three dialogue at the Marble Collegiate Church. Um, I didn't have that really sustainable uh, motives, if you may say, or wish uh, to develop these relations until we met Rabbi McSchneider in 2005. Uh, and the reason is because that mistrust is very, very deep. Uh, and, and that is the most challenging part of that, until now. Uh, I still remember, by the way, when I, uh, and I mentioned this several times on different occasions, that when I went to, uh, we wanted to go to his synagogue in the New York synagogue at the time, I announced to our congregation at the 96th Street Mosque, and an Egyptian uh, Muslim stood up, and he said, are you kidding us? I said, I'm serious. He said, what are they going to do? He said, we are going to the synagogue. He said, no, 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 we don't go. I said, why? <laughs> he said, because these people are claiming to be chosen. And his understanding, in his own understanding of chosenness, means exclusiveness, means, sorry, arrogance, uh, uh, means don't want to befriend, and so on and so forth. So I remember a verse in the Holy Quran that says, and I mentioned that in the book, that we had that concept of khayru ummah. It means that Muslims are claiming to be the, the best nation. So kuntum khayru ummatin. This is in chapter number three uh, of the Holy Quran. So I said to him, since we feel that we are the best, let the best meet the chosen. So we, so, so we went to a synagogue, and, and I still remember, I know, the, the guy who sat in the, at the corner of the, of the synagogue, because it was a building, and after the service we have discussions, and after the discussion we have kiddush. So we, had, we have a lot of food. And so we, we went back to the mosque, and he said, you know, that's beautiful. Not only that they receive us smilingly, but they gave us kiddush. They, they, didn't, they didn't say kiddush, but food. They gave us food. I said, that's what Jews are. And so... Uh, but also, I remember when I was in the synagogue, and after the presentation, he was challenged by his own congregation about the Amalekite. Right? Right. Okay, and, but one lady stood up, and I still remember that she said to me, you know, it is impossible for us Jews to be peaceful with Muslims. So I was, I, I was trying to, be, to smile as beautiful as much, <laughs> and I said to her, why is that? She said, because you guys have a madrasa, midrash, where you train your kid to hate, not only to hate, but she said to kill us. So I said to her, first of all, I am also a madrasa graduate. Okay. Secondly, how did you come to that conclusion? And she said, because I watch a movie. And in that movie, it talks about you know, how madrasa students are being radicalized you know, and hating Jews and so on and so forth. And so I said to her, come to the, to the mosque, meet the Muslims. You know, I think you need to challenge that perception that you have in your mind right now. Rather than I'm talking to you, why you don't come to the mosque? So she came to the mosque. And she is now one of the uh, participants, if not, if not mistaken, it's called Salam Shalom Sisterhood. Uh, one of the ladies that very much uh, involved in that uh, meeting between ladies. Sometimes meeting, talking about food, talking about how to raise the kids, the ladies. So my point is that, you know, September 11 really changed. And, um, but I think uh, September 11 is just, um, just um, a factor. The real changing changes happen basically because we want to fight it. And I, and I think this is what I, I consider this, this is the biggest jihad for me, to fight my own pre-existent uh, perception about the others. Thank you. In fact, there are some people from Salam Shalom who are here. And, uh, it's a Real great honor to have you here. Um, all right, for those of you who are uh, fans of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, and you don't have to raise your hands, <laughs> you know that television shows are not always the best way to bring people together in lasting relationships. Most of those couples never actually make it. Rabbi Schneier and Imam Ali may be one of the few pairs who met on television and are still together. So, 
<laughs> Imam Ali, why don't you tell us how it is that the two of you met? Yes, as I mentioned that, you know, when I met several rabbis um, prior to my meeting with Rabbi Max Schneier, I, I didn't really take it very seriously. Although I, I consider them great people, Rabbi Potasnik, Rabbi um, uh, Rubenstein, and others. But um, towards the end of 2005, I was invited to a CBS um, a, a television a studio to an interview about Pope John's outreach, uh, interfaith outreach. I didn't realize that there would be another person uh, coming to the interview, and suddenly uh, a rabbi came in. He was very young, now still young. <laughs> <laughs> so he was introduced to me by someone, and really he extended his hand, but barely looking at my face. Almost we didn't look at each other. And then we separated, we exchanged cards. After some months, I knew, I heard his voice come to 96. I was an assistant imam at the 96th Street. He met with my, my boss at the time, Imam Abu Namus, invited him to his synagogue. Um, and then, to make the story short, uh, he sent his assistant some months later to invite me to, um, to, uh, to um, an interfaith dialogue, Jewish Muslim dialogue at the NYU, where ma we are, along with Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi uh, Imam uh, uh, Latif. From that moment, um, to be honest, as I met other rabbis, um, I feel that. Uh, this rabbi represents what religion, what does religion means. It is about honesty. Uh, it is about friendship. It is about uh, uh, embracing one another. It's about building partnership. And not only that, but basically what he said is, is about fighting for others. Uh, and what he told me in private, as you told people in public, so um, our trust grows and grows and grows from s since then. But the challenge that later on came on. The challenge is that every time that I, came, I went to the synagogue, my own congregants really challenged me. Do you really trust the Jewish people? So I asked him why. He said, this is what the Quran says. This is what the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad said and said about the Jewish people. And he was challenged also by his own congregations. Do you really trust the Muslims? So we met to talk about this, how to respond to our own congregations. And so we came up with an idea of uh, exchanging questions, Q&A. What is the chosenness? What is the khayru umma? What jihad is all about? What sharia? How is the woman in the Muslim you know, uh, tradition? Um, and then we decided to write the book. And that's why we came up with the book. So basically the book was the result of that challenge that we are facing in our own respective communities. Because we are challenged. Until now, as the rabbi mentions, that the journey is far away, the dreamland is still far away, uh, uh, but the good things that we have begun. Finding a partner for interfaith dialogue is a, um, is a challenging thing. Um, you really are, in many ways, um, putting some part of your own career in your partner's hands. You, there is an element of trust that is implicit in such a relationship. And, and, um, and then when you find the right partner, it is such an extraordinary uh, gift. So, Mark, how did you decide that, that Shamsi was, that this was the partnership that you really were going to, to move forward with? These are really good questions, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> We've been all over the world. We've Never been asked that question before. Um, look, I've been very, very blessed professionally with two extraordinary partners. First, in terms of black Jewish relations, uh, with my loved friend and partner, Russell Simmons. Um, and, uh, and now in Muslim Jewish relations with my very dear and cherished friend, Imam Shamsi Ali. I think that what has cemented this relationship and this friendship and why we're able to project this image and disseminate this message to the public at large because we not only talk the talk, but we walk the walk. I remember, as you might all recall, when the Jewish Community Center, the Chabad Center in Mumbai, yeah. uh, in India, was attacked, and 
that uh, lovely rabbinic couple, I believe the Holtzbergs were massacred. It was the imam who called me. The uh, attacks took place on late Wednesday. And he said, I'd like you to come to the mosque on Friday. And the mosque on Friday, here on 96th Street, the one o'clock service, there are more than 2,000 people. More than 2,000 people. I, I often would comment to my congregation, you know, I'm amazed, 2,000 people and no kiddish. I mean, nothing, <laughs> nothing. I mean, at the Hampton Synagogue, you know, that would be an impossibility, you know, to have, uh, you know, we always say the, what has become the um, secret of our success are three words, kiddish to follow, right? So, okay. but, uh, but seriously. Remember that. So at the mosque, 2,000 people, Muslims from across the spectrum, from all over the city, and the imam asked that I address the audience. We had the ambassador of India there with us. And uh, if you know my nature, my character, you know, I, I pull no punches. And, and I spoke about when acts of violence, particularly acts of anti-Semitism, are perpetrated from within the Muslim community then it's not the responsibility of Jews to speak out. It's not the responsibility of Christians to speak out. But it's the responsibility of Muslims to speak out. And to hold members of their own community and their faith accountable. Just as we would do the same if, God forbid, there were or there are attacks emanating from the Jewish community against uh, Muslims. And I'm sure the Imam will be happy to share with you the, uh, our famous rally. In fact, I, I shouldn't tell that story. Well, why don't you tell the story about with, with Peter King and the hearings? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, why don't you tell the story? I think it was in 2000, I forgot, but when Peter King organized a hearing in Congress, uh, uh, about the radicalization of the Muslim communities in the United States. Uh, it's really bad on us because we look like all, all of us radicals. And so the rabbi came to me and he said, you know what, um, um, I wanted to do something. So I said, what are you going to do? Uh, I think the beginning he said, that, you know, let's do press conference. Uh, but then we thought that we have done that a lot. So finally he came up with an idea of organizing a rally in Times Square. So... We did prepare, and during the day, we had uh, thousands of participants came out in the rainy day. Um, Russell Simmons and many uh, other stars came, with Jews, Christians, and Hindus, and Buddhists. And, and this is the man, basically, behind that rally. He is the one stood there saying that if an attack on any community, in the Muslim community, is an attack on all of us, Americans. And the theme of the, of the rally on that day was, today I am a Muslim too. And I still remember Russell Simon tweet out saying, today I'm a Muslim too. And his Twitter was received by Kardashian. <laughs> and she also tweeted out saying, I'm a Muslim too. So, so, so the word I'm a Muslim too went all over the Hollywood people. And it's just really a tremendous thing for, for the Muslim community. So that's thereby. But it's not only that. Everywhere, basically. You know, for Muslim community being as... Uh, um, we have to say that we are now in a very challenging moment. Uh, internally speaking, we are facing uh, radical tendencies be of, because of the anger, for many reasons. There are m too much anger within the Muslim community and ignorant at the same time. But from outside, we temp, uh, you know, tended to be, to be misconceived that looks Muslims are not really uh, doing something against radical tendencies in the Muslim community. So to have a Jewish rabbi standing to our side, supporting the Muslim community, and saying that any, anything that is against the Muslims against us is really boosting our spirit. And, and that, for me, is, uh, is, is, it has become uh, an individual uh, responsibility to say that any anti-Semitism occur anywhere else is, is an attack on me also as a Muslim. 
And any Muslim denies Holocaust, for example, is, 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 denial, is a denial of my own rights. And I think this is something that, that is, this is our motto. It is fighting for each other. And, and if I just might add, which was one of the highlights of our friendship, that this past November, November 9th, I was invited to be the keynote speaker in the Austrian parliament in Vienna. It was the 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht. And my family is originally from Vienna. My father was born in Vienna. And there were generations of rabbis in Vienna. So when I accepted the invitation of the Jewish community, I asked if I could bring the imam with me. And let's remember, this is not the United States. This is Austria. And let's put this in a certain context. Today in Austria, there are 8 million people. At best, there are 15,000 Jews. And depending on what figures you believe, there are between 600,000 and 800,000 Muslims and growing. And you're also dealing with a Muslim community that is completely, totally ignorant when it comes to the Holocaust and when it comes to Kristallnacht. Huh. So when the Imam got up to speak in Vienna, they thought this Imam was from Mars. They never heard any Muslim cleric and leader the way he was unequivocal in his condemnation of anti-Semitism. The way Imam Shamsi Ali referenced the deafening silence, not only of the Christian world, of the Muslim world, during Kristallnacht. And then, at a luncheon that was held in our honor for the various religious leaders of Austria, it was the Imam and I who got the president of the Austrian Muslim community, Dr. Senyak, to agree, and this was reported you know, in the media, that by next Kristallnacht, there will be some form of Kristallnacht slash Holocaust education that will be introduced in Austrian Muslim schools. Wow. That's the work that we look to inspire that's the work that we look to elevate. Again, it's about fighting for the other. Whether I'm speaking out on behalf of the Muslim community or whether it's the Imam speaking out on behalf of the Jewish community. Let's talk about some of the toughest nuts to crack. There are challenges to bringing the Muslim and Jewish communities together. As much as we might be passionate about it, our flocks aren't always so eager. What have you found to be some of the most effective ways of dealing with such potentially divisive issues as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, those challenging verses in the Hebrew Bible or the Quran, and that notion of Jews as the chosen people and Muslims as the best nation, and then outright bigotry? How have you tried to address those sorts of things? Um, Imam Ali, why don't you begin and then Rabbi uh, It reminds me, when we um, organized the first summit of Imams and Rabbis in the United States under the auspices of his um, Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, at the 96th Street Mosque, we, meet, we met from 9 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock, and almost none spoke anything else but Israel and Palestine. So just, Imagine 25 imams and 25 rabbis. Looks like nothing else issue between us except Palestine and Israel. So finally, both of us intervened. I <coughs> said so we have to intervene because almost no, nothing else that we talk about. So um, um, the issue basically, particularly when we talk about um, uh, the conflict in the Middle East and particularly Palestinian and Israeli conflict, the issue is what I used to call the 800 gorilla in the room. Uh, it is the most dividing uh, factor between Muslims and Jews. But unfortunately, I think I disagree who says that our 
relations must be defined by this conflict. Because these conflicts began what? When? These relations between Jews and Muslims started from a long, long time before any conflict that took place in, in, in the Middle East. So to, to say that our relations, Muslims' Jewish relations, must be defined by Palestinian and Israeli conflict, I think is too naive. And I think we have to change it. Okay? Uh, now, when we come to the issue of um, some verses of the Holy Quran, I think, uh, and, and certainly also when we come to the verses of the Bible, uh, um, the, the, the key word to that is education. You know, imagine what happened in Nigeria recently. You know, in the name of Islam, that people kept, you know, uh, how you call it? Uh, yeah? Uh, kidnap girls, and uh, oh, yeah. in the name of the Holy Quran, in the name of Islam, so look at that. So uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a person who studied this religion since my childhood, and I memorized the Holy Quran, the whole Holy Quran, this book, you know, I never found any verse in the Holy Quran says that, you know, take anyone else and make them slaves, you know, but this is what's happening. This is what's happening. So I think it's about education, it's about ignorance, understanding of our, of our of religion, and it's a this is one of the biggest challenges that I feel uh, as my own responsibility to face. Um, um, but don't forget that uh, media also plays an important role. Uh, we want the media to be more responsible in educating our communities. You know, when I received the rabbis and I embraced him as my, my great friend, uh, you, didn't see, you didn't see that on the uh, front page of New York Times or New York Post. Uh, but when there is an imam somewhere in Peshawar, talk evil about others, you will see that in the front page of representing Islam. It looks like that imam is representing Islam. That's the way media present our community. Similarly, when I was in Saudi Arabia, you know, pick up the newspapers and nothing else good about the Jewish people. Everything is bad. And, and, so, and that's the media. It happens both in, in, in both worlds, about the Muslims and about the non-Muslims in the Muslim world. And I think it's, it's a challenge for us Muslims and non-Muslims, Jewish particularly, and, and the Muslims, that we must work together in educating our media people to educate our community. Uh, but finally, um, um, coming back again to the issue of uh, uh, history, um, I think we, uh, we have misread um, the history in many ways. We are concentrating on the dark spot of the history, the dark part of our history. We forgot that Muslims and Jews in the past used to have honeymoon together. We used to live together beautifully, sweetly. But then when we come to, to these days, because of the many factors that I mentioned, we say, no, 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 we've never been friends. And that's what in the minds of the ladies that I met in Rabbi's uh, synagogues, that we Jewish people will never be peaceful with the Muslims because we have been. There's a kind of mindset. So this is a very challenging, and we are determined that we are going to face those challenges. Mark? First, we need to acknowledge that there are a host of issues that transcend the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And understand, we do not avoid, we do not eschew addressing this conflict, but there needs to be a recognition that as the children of Abraham, not only do we share a common faith, but we share a common fate. And how our single destiny must strengthen our bonds of concern, compassion, and caring for each other. I'll give you three examples just in the last four months. In January, the European affiliate of the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, which is known as the Gathering of European Muslims and Jewish Leaders, these are Muslim and Jewish leader representatives from 25 of the 29 EU states. I led in January the first joint Muslim-Jewish coalition to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg to meet with the Secretary General. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe had just passed legislation that would prohibit ritual circumcision for both Muslims and Jews. And uh, fortunately, we and others were successful in seeing this resolution defeated, but we were the only voice that spoke collectively on behalf of Muslims and Jews. And I remember when the Secretary General 
of the European Council, as we left the room, he said, Rabbi, I have to tell you something. Had I closed my eyes, I would not have known the difference between the rabbis and the imams. Perfect example. February, we took on the government of Denmark. Denmark passed legislation of all countries that would prohibit the ritual slaughtering of animals in terms of uh, halal and kashrut. And uh, again, this coalition was the only joint Muslim Jewish voice to meet, sit down with the uh, Minister of Agriculture. And, uh, and our negotiations continue, but again, when government leaders, when they see that it's not just Jews speaking for Jews and Muslims just speaking for Muslims, <coughs> but the fact that it is a collective voice, that we have that synergy and, and, and that fusion, um, it really speaks volumes. And then, which we can discuss later, you know, when I met with President Abbas you know, in uh, April, and uh, I must tell you, I had no intent whatsoever to even bring up the Holocaust, whatsoever. So what happens, you know, I was in uh, Israel for Passover, which I'm usually there. I know what, see, Emmanuel, you, you have an advantage you know, that I don't have. You have only one Seder. When I'm left in this, when I'm in this country as an Orthodox rabbi, an Orthodox, you have to have two Seders. But when I go to Israel, I get away with one Seder. That's one of my great incentives of going to Israel for Pesach. So um, when I got the call from my friend, the Palestinian ambassador in Washington, that President Abbas would like to see me, so I brought two of my friends with me. Um, one's from Vienna, one's from uh, Toronto. And I really went <laughs> to see Abbas to enlist his support on the whole Denmark Shrita issue. Because I always remind President Abbas, you're not only the Palestinian leader, you're also a Muslim leader. And you have a certain responsibility as a Muslim to speak out on behalf of Jewish community, again, nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I'm sitting there, and then it's like I had an epiphany, because myself and my two friends were both, uh, the three of us are sons of Holocaust survivors. So I said to President Abbas, we, we were discussing how important it is to be empathetic. It's one of the principal lessons of, um, of the uh, Passover Seder experience, right? We say, behold, so we have to see ourselves as though we were the slaves, you know, to develop an empathetic imagination. And I said to President Abbas, I said, you know, next week is Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And it would be so significant for you as the president of the Palestinian people to express your solidarity, express your sympathy to the Jewish people on what is probably you know, our, our, our most tragic day of the year. And before I could finish the sentence, he starts going on and on. He says, Rabbi, I want you to know how I feel about the Holocaust. It's the most, as far as I'm concerned, the most tragic date. I mean, it's, it's the most tragic uh, it's the greatest tragedy in the modern day era, and uh, you know I uh, you know, fully you know express my sympathy. So I said, President Boss, you know, don't just share that with me. You know, why don't you let the Jewish world know? And that's when he called in the Secretary of the Cabinet, you know, and, and the rest is history. So <clears throat> even to combat Holocaust denial is one of those issues that transcends the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But getting back, and with this I'll conclude, to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, both the Imam and I believe, and we've said this publicly many, many times, not if, but when Israel and Palestinians do arrive at some resolution, at some peace plan, how will this resolution be implemented? How will it be executed when a majority of Muslims don't trust Jews? A majority of Jews don't trust Muslims. 
And one of the reasons for this underlying mistrust is our lack of understanding and our misperceptions of our sacred texts. When Muslims believe that we represent ourselves as the chosen people, and they understand chosenness to be superior and better and to be elitist, or as you said, to be arrogant, how could you expect the Muslim community to trust the other? As Jews, if we believe that the Quran speaks so disparagingly about Jews and Christians, how can we possibly trust the other? And one of the most valuable lessons that I learned from this man in writing this book with him for three years and studying the Quran um, backwards and forwards that just like we have an oral text, right? We have the oral law, excuse me, we have the written law, then we have the oral law, and you need the oral law to interpret the written law. Islam is no different. Islam is no different. Not a single person in this room would dare to interpret the Torah in a literal fashion. Not one of you. How would you explain an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, if you didn't have the oral law? How would you explain the way we are commanded to destroy the Amalekites if Maimonides had not interpreted that, that particular verse to mean, yes, the, uh, to destroy Amalek-like behavior, not the physical Amalek, uh, Amalekite, and I can go on and on and on. So all I ask is that you extend the same courtesy when it comes to the Quran. Extend the same courtesy. And before you look at the literal text of the Quran, and then you arrive at certain judgments, first ask either an Islamic scholar or look in the Islamic codes and see what is the oral interpretation? What is the oral explanation? And if we can get more and more Jews and Muslims to understand how our two religions both have that same dynamic, written and oral, I think that that would help create a new paradigm for greater understanding between Muslims and Jews. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for, for speaking about that. Um, my previous pulpit, I, I, I handed a passage from Deuteronomy to my congregants, which talked about the destruction of the Canaanite peoples. And I said, where do you think this comes from? And when I told them it came from the Torah, they... Mm -hmm. So it's, it's such an important point to understand that just as we have Torah, um, Sheba al the oral Torah, the Muslim tradition has the Hadith and, and its oral um, interpretations too. So it's easy to get stuck on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as obviously happened in that gathering. But Muslims and Jews have so much in common from the immigrant experience and the effort of one generation to help their children make it in America without losing their own religious identity, to concerns about minority rights at home and obviously peace abroad. In your view, what are the present day needs and events that should unite Muslims and Jews. So, Imam Ali, why don't you begin, and then Rabbi Schneier. I think we have every reason to say that um, um, this community are two communities are the most identical communities of all, uh, from theological perspective down to even cultures and traditions that both communities have, um, and so. Um, uh, to say that it is truly difficult to unite these two communities, I think uh, that's what the challenge is, to change our own mindset. And as I said earlier, that the, I think the most challenging is to change our mindset. Uh, uh, and, and that is really, um, for me, for me uh, as I said, my background is this, coming to the situation right now, is really challenging. Uh, it's not about what the people said about our engagement about our friendship, but it's about our own. And that is the most difficult part of it, 
to change the perceptions that we had about other. And, 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 and so, uh, coming back again, um, um, I think um, if we just can go beyond the, uh, the uh, dividing lines, as you mentioned about, uh, not going beyond doesn't mean that we don't pay attention. Uh, the issue of Palestine and Israel is, is very crucial to both communities. We have passion, uh, both of us. And, and, and I think the only question to both communities that we need to ask is, do you want peace? And I'm sure that both communities want peace, uh, although we may have different ways of how to get into that promised land, the peace. Uh, but uh, both communities want peace. And that's why we, at least that we have a good intention to engage in a peaceful dialogue uh, and go beyond just dialogue, but partnership, but even not only partnership, but uh, even fighting for, for the others. One of the, uh, the dilemma that I have seen in the past about the conflict in the Middle East is about the, uh, the uh, victim's mentality, how you call it, that we feel that we are the one who are vict the victims and others are not. Uh, you ask the Muslims, or oh, we are victims, and certainly the others as well. They have that kind of mentalities. I think that, ch that what we need to do is challenging ourselves to put our feet on the shoes of others. And I think that's the best way. And I, I mentioned that in my book, that uh, this is number one. Number two, the conflict in the Middle East, unfortunately, had been um, politicized by outsiders in many ways. And as Muslims, I know that, that there are many Muslim leaders in in the Muslim world, tend to use uh, you know, pal Palestinian issue for their own political purposes. Uh, the denial of Holocaust, for example, by President of Iran uh, a few years back, has nothing to do with Islam, it's nothing to do possibly with Iranian people, but for his own gain, to show that he's a hero, a hero for Palestinian people. So it had been taken for political uh, interest for, uh, by some leaders around the world. So I think, again, uh, coming back, um, uh, there are many reasons to, to, to be together, I mean, a reason to be united, and I think there are less reasons to, to be divided. Rabbi Schneier? I think it's, it's um, so critical to be able to have these lines, open lines of communication. And I'll even give you a little media scoop. Uh, which will be, I've been told, which will be coming out in the um, Israeli press on Friday. It's a conversation I had, but I'm comfortable enough to have a conversation, even to come up with what some might consider some uh, creative yet crazy ideas. So back in November, after we were in Vienna, so the imam was supposed to go with me to uh, Jerusalem. But we're both congregational officials, officiants. And we both know that if the congregation needs us, we have to come home. So uh, I was fortunate. I wasn't needed in the Hamptons uh, that week. Uh, but the imam, he had a wedding. I think it was the, your, the president of your mosque, his daughter. Okay. And what happened that the president of Israel, Shimon Paris, had a beautiful reception at his residence to celebrate the publication of the book. The following day, that was on a Tuesday evening, Wednesday, we were scheduled to meet with President Abbas in Ramallah, who was going to do the same thing. So when I arrived in Jerusalem, President, I was informed President Abbas has left the country so, Rabbi, you're going to be meeting with the new Palestinian Prime Minister, Rami Amdallah, who, as you know, has been asked by President Abbas to work with the very controversial new Palestinian government, which I'll be happy to discuss you know, later. So, I go to Ramallah. I'm sitting in the Prime Minister's office. He's a lovely gentleman. He's the former president of the University of Nablus. And uh, he made me feel very much at home, you know, a very warm conversation. And I said, you know, let's talk about these peace negotiations. I said, look, I get it when it comes to the settlements. I'm sure there's some resolution we can work out. Even right of return, 
you know, we can come up with some symbolic number. But I, or, you know, or swaps. But I said to the Prime Minister, I said, um, the city of Jerusalem, you need to understand that for the Jewish people, Jerusalem is not some 66-year-old political aspiration. It's at the very heart of our religions, at the very core of Judaism. Our synagogues are oriented toward Jerusalem. Our two holy temples were built in Jerusalem. And we pray three times a day for the rebuilding of Jerusalem, how Jerusalem is in the forefront of Jewish consciousness, Jewish hopes, and Jewish dreams. And then, Josh, I had an epiphany. Had to be God. Had to be God. That, that, that's what they're writing about. I looked at the Prime Minister. I said, however this situation is resolved, and I'm not going to get involved. I'll leave that up to you and the politicians. I'd like to suggest the following. In addition to negotiating the territorial rights to the city, however you politicians work that out, I believe that we should also negotiate the naming rights to the city. And I looked at the Prime Minister and I said, I'm going to be quite open. As an American Jew, if I saw a map of Palestine with the capital Jerusalem, I wouldn't feel terribly comfortable. But if I saw a map of Palestine and the capital is Al-Quds, which I know from my friend Imam Shamsi Ali is the Islamic name of Jerusalem, Al-Quds, by all means. And I said from an emotional, psychological point of view, why don't we negotiate where we own our name and you own your name? However it's divided, however you guys work it out. Whatever is worked out, you have Al-Quds. And we keep the name Jerusalem. So it's actually coming out. <laughs> Uh, in the Israeli press on Friday, this idea of, in addition to the territorial rights, that we should also address the naming rights to the city. But the point I'm trying to make that I felt comfortable enough, I could never have felt this way before I met my friend Imam and before our work together. But when you sit down with other leaders of the Muslim community, you do feel that there is a certain familial bond. I remember the king of Bahrain once saying to me, you know what, Rabbi? At the end of the day, we're cousins. We may have had a few family disagreements, <laughs> but we're cousins and we're family. And we need to try and bring that spirit and, and, that, and that sense of family back into the dynamic of Muslim-Jewish relations. Yeah. Well said. And I'm curious as to what the reaction to you. We'll I, see. We'll see. Wonderful. If I apply for a rabbinic position at Emmanuel, you'll know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is, we're going to take some questions um, from all of you. Won't get to too many, but, but a couple of them. This one's of a different, uh, a different nature. And um, so here it is. I'm Jewish and my fiancé is Muslim. Mm. What advice can you give us as an interfaith couple to find welcoming religious communities where we can worship together and raise kids in an accepting, open environment? That's definitely yours. <laughs> Um, I think I would like to start by saying that, um, you know, I do believe in, 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 in that religion is, is private, is a personal. Uh, I do believe that choosing a religion is a very much a private choice, a personal choice. Uh, and so when someone uh, marries of different religious traditions, I think first they have to understand that... Um, it is about choice. 
And in our understanding as Muslims, I'm a Muslim not because my parents are Muslims. In my understanding, I'm a Muslim because I choose to be Muslims. And I understand the religion, and I, I have self-conviction that this is the religion is, good, is great for me, uh, and that's why I'm a Muslim. Uh, and so when someone else chooses other religions, I have to have some similar respect as I want it to be respected. So I think what you need to do is um, you need to respect one another. Uh, you need to um, understand one another's traditions. But there is a crucial thing, and that is about learning of one another. Uh, because before, uh, you are now uh, fiancé, not yet husband and wife, but when you become a husband and a wife, then you are going to live under the same roof in 24 hours. Uh, at that moment, everything will be exposed. You know, things that you don't know about your spouse, you're going to know everything else <laughs> because you are living under the same, same roof. So you need to learn about your spouse, about their tradition, about their cultures. Through learning, you're going to build an understanding. Only by understanding one another, we are going to have real compassion, real you know, feelings of love and compassion. And through love and compassion, you can build partnership. Not only that, you are going to slowly uh, build what I used to call when I advise couples, you're going to slowly uh, uh, build uh, humbleness of one another. And the meaning of humbleness that you appreciate of one another. You appreciate that my spouse is even better than me, and I'm not perfect. That's why she is or he is there to, to make me perfect. Uh, and so don't, don't worry about the different traditions, different religions. Uh, it's just about how to manage differences. Diversity, difference is a blessing. But sometimes we fail to manage our differences. Please. Well, we can look forward to when Ramadan and Yom Kippur you know, coincide. Maybe we can do that. Um, look, you know, as an Orthodox rabbi, I uh, firmly believe that it's important to have one religion uh, in the home. And uh, I must tell you that if I was if I would have been given the question of Jewish Christian or Jewish Muslim, as I mentioned before, you know, Jews and Muslims, both in terms of theology, in terms of uh, practice, you know, we have much more in common. You know, our dietary laws, my friend prays five times a day, I pray three times a day, Somehow I can work it out where it's only twice a day. We can get mincha marav, all right, so it's only twice a day. Um, we face Jerusalem, you face Mecca, you have your Hajj, we used to have our Aliyah. Um, so there are many, many similarities. But uh, if that couple would like to discuss this with me privately, I'm more than happy to discuss it. <laughs> well said, well said. Um, Imam Ali, what is your advice for many young people that want to make a difference in their native Muslim countries where there's violence between different religious groups, for example, Pakistan? How can people get involved to try to shape? I think we need to start from our own home here in the United States of America. The um, United States is still considered uh, the sole superpower uh, in the world. So that any small thing that we can do here in New York particularly can uh, have a big impact. You know, as the rabbi mentioned that um, if I have occasionally from time to time to go back to Indonesia, really feel uh, people in Indonesia um, feel that I have done quite big things in the United States of America because I can build relations with Jews, with Christians, with, with others. And for Indonesia, this is a tremendous, tremendously big thing. Uh, because uh, they never imagined that an Indonesian can do that here in the United States. So what I'd like to, to, uh, to say to that uh, uh, brother or sister that, you know, start from here. If you are a Muslim here in this country, go out and be friend with your, with your neighbors. Be nice. Just show them what, what does it mean to be Muslim, what does it mean to be a good person. And in my, my, my own definition of Muslims, uh, simply this, being humble to God and humble to others. Serve your Lord and serve others, you know, because uh, if you are able to serve God, but you, are, you fail to serve humanity, that serf, service of God is a kind of questionable. It's, there's a big question. It's really serving God. Uh, because, and that's why when you pray, for example, when a Muslim pray, 
we began with saying Allahu Akbar, and this means God is greatest. But that prayer will not be accepted unless we turn our face to the right and to the left and say, Assalamu alaikum, or peace be unto you. So you see these two aspects of service. Service your Lord and service humanity. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you need to start from here. And then impact your community. And I mean back home in Pakistan. I want to close our evening tonight with a, a lesson from the Muslim tradition that I learned with one of the groups that I studied with, with the mosque and the synagogue in northern Westchester. And the lesson is that Muhammad taught that even if the world is coming to an end tomorrow, each of us must plant a seed today. And if someone asks us, why are you planting a seed when the world is coming to an end? We are to answer, because there must always be hope. Now, you won't be surprised to learn that a similar text exists in the Talmud. One day, Honi went walking and came upon an old man planting a carob tree. He inquired, how long till this tree bears fruit? The man answered, 70 years. Honey asked, do you believe that you will live to see it? The man replied, as my ancestors planted for me, so I plant for my children. It's a beautiful message, but the story doesn't end there. Honey sat down and he fell asleep and he slept for 70 years. When he awoke, he saw a man picking fruit from the tree and asked him, are you the same man who planted this tree? No, the man answered, I'm his grandson. The two of you are the planters of the seeds. Your book is one of those seeds of hope. Universal understanding doesn't come easily, but one day we too will awaken to a new reality. And if we should not, then at least we will have planted seeds for our children and grandchildren because there must always be hope. Please join me in thanking Imam Shamsi Ali and Rabbi Mark Schneider. Thank you very much.